Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? No. Oh, how about that? Yeah. All right. My name is Molly Anderson, and I'm the executive director of the Nantucket Athenaeum. And on behalf of the Hayes and Labe families, I wish to welcome you all to the Constance Labe Hayes Memorial Lecture. First, a couple of housekeeping announcements. If you'd turn off the cell phones. And also, tonight's speaker will be selling books after the lecture at the back of the room. So if you would love to buy one of those books, if you don't already have them, they'll be available then. Public libraries can make a real difference in people's lives. And this was true for Constance. And she especially loved the Athenaeum from a very young age. And so it's really an honor and a privilege for us to host this lecture every year in her memory. And I'd like to introduce John Hayes now, who is going to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. It's hard to believe that uh, this is the 13th uh, lecture we've done in honor of Connie and the Athenaeum. And as Molly said, Connie loved the Athenaeum. It uh, was a place where she won an art award when she was five years old. <laughs> and 35 years later, um, she in part won her Pulitzer Prize at the New York Times with her colleagues writing uh, for the 9-11 uh, uh, work. Um, and I, I think she attributed a lot of it to her time in the Athenaeum. She also wrote uh, Truth and Power at the Coca-Cola Company in the upstairs, quiet, very sane place to, to in, the, in the, the robust town, you can actually find a place to quietly write. Um, so this lecture series has been a wonderful way to celebrate Connie's life. And tonight we're honored to have Adam Gopnik as our speaker. When Molly suggested Adam was, uh, she had an angle on getting him here. Um, I told one of my colleagues at work and she said, um, isn't he an amazing writer? And um, I, I could probably leave the introduction, introduction right there, but um, I went a little deeper and I spoke to his uh, editor at the uh, New Yorker, a friend of mine, uh, David Remnick, who said the following. Uh, Adam is a voracious reader, a polymath, whose interests and mastery range from art history to American history. From the curse of guns in America to the curse of, well, Trump in America. <laughs> there really is nothing that doesn't interest him. On a plane, he could be reading a biography of Ulysses Grant or a biography of Joni Mitchell. His enthusiasms never end and his critical mind is boundless. So that's another way of introducing Adam, but I think I'll just end it with my colleague and say, isn't he an amazing writer? And with further ado, Adam Gopnik. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, John. It's, it's, um, it's nice to hear David say those things. He never said them to me. Um, uh, it's wonderful to be here tonight and this occasion in honor of Connie and especially to be here in Nantucket at the Athenaeum. This was the easiest yes I will speak it. Thank you, ma'am. Um, it, it was the easiest yes of the year to come here. I have not been on Nantucket since I was um, eight years old, but I remember it very clearly that I managed to escape with the booty of a glass whale, which I gather is, uh, is standard. Um, as John said, I write about a lot of subjects, and I write, I try to write with as much uh, passion as I can. Right now, like so many of us, I'm a bit consumed by politics and political questions. Um, I'm in the middle of writing a book about the meanings of liberal democracy with the assistance of my daughter, Olivia, who's very much my interlocutor on the project. But I thought that tonight, instead of giving you a formal lecture on that very formal and vexed topic, I would do something more foundational. I would talk to you a bit about how it is we begin in life, how it is we go on in life, about the process of 
the years about the makings of families, finding a home, losing a home, remaking a home, all of those things that are foundational to our existence, in part because I love writing about them and telling people stories about them, and part because I do believe in the deepest recess of my heart that true politics, good politics, healthy politics grow from the ground up, from our common shared experience into the world rather than on down from principle into our lives. The world is made of rooms. The world is made of rooms in the first instance. And if we understand how rooms come to be inhabited, I think we understand something significant about the world that we live in. The first principle that I wanted to talk about is that I think we leave home to find home. We leave home to find home. We have to leave home to find home. Olivia, our daughter, is going to be leaving home in a month to find a new home at university. Um, and one of the interesting things about that process is that very often those of us who leave home first are not the ones who are most unhappy, but just the opposite. It's because we've loved having a home that we leave early to go and make a new one. That was certainly the case with my then girlfriend, soon to be wife, Martha, when we left Montreal, Canada, our home, in the summer of 1980, having just graduated from college weeks before, to come to New York City to make a home for ourselves. Um, we got on a bus in Montreal. It was like something out of a 1940s musical comedy, because the bus said, New York City, on the front. And there was a guy with a bow tie and a uniform putting all of the bags into the hold. My father came to see us off, um, which is something fathers are always supposed to do. In every uh, great book about voyages and leaving, the father comes. If you think about the, the Three Musketeers, for instance, that wonderful um, story of D'Artagnan leaving Gascony to go to Paris, and you may recall that D'Artagnan's father uh, says to D'Artagnan, when you get to Paris, fight duels uh, with everyone you meet. <laughs> and that's how the Musketeers begin. Um, my father was a Jewish professor of English literature, and that was not the advice that he chose to give me. <laughs> but he gave me a piece of advice, every bit is valuable. This is what he said to me as I was getting on the bus to go to New York City. He said, remember when you get to New York, never underestimate the other person's insecurities. <laughs> yes, it takes a moment to see the profound wisdom of that. It's pretty much all you need to tell your kids as they go off into the world. And it's what he told me. And Martha and I got on that bus and we came to New York. And within a week, we had rented the smallest apartment in the history of human habitation. Now, my friend Hillary helped me here just a few minutes ago as you were coming in to lay down this blue rectangle, this nine by 11 rectangle. And what we were doing Hillary was laying down the precise dimensions of our first apartment. <laughs> and Martha and I lived within this blue rectangle for three and a half years. Three and a half years we lived here. Get to stand up, take a look. Yes, pity, I'll, I'll take you on a tour of it if you like. <laughs> right here was the window that we looked out onto a church, which was sort of the winning feature about it. Um, over here, uh, was the triple fold sofa, a little foam sofa that folded out, and that's where we slept every night, and we, then we put it back together. We didn't have a coverlet, but we had a big red sleeping bag uh, that Martha had brought with her into our marriage. She explained to me that she had gotten it from an old boyfriend, though how she had gotten it or what she had done to earn it, I never inquired all these years. Um, here was my study. My study was right here. It's my, I had a typewriter and a, sla a little piece of glass that I worked on. I was writing for the New Yorker, though they didn't know it then. Um, <laughs> back here was the kitchen. As a kitchen, we had a kind of little three-burner stove and a kind of easy-bake oven underneath it. And I cooked every night. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. This is the bathroom and then the door out. And then because we had a kind of bourgeois orientation. This was the dining room right here, because every good family needs a dining room as well as a living room. So we had a slab of travertine about four feet long that we ate on every night. And here, because we were, and then as we remain, a wholly 
uh, egalitarian and emancipated couple. This was Martha's study right here, which consisted of a large um, uh, blow up chair where she did her work um, in sharp opposition to my occupation of this part. We lived here in this space for three and a half years, as I say, and we loved it when we first um, uh, visited it. And we only discovered after we'd been here uh, for one night, uh, the one drawback, we had only seen it in daytime, in daylight, and then we discovered, of course, that as soon as you turned off the lights at night, it became flooded with cockroaches who came out from this baseboard directly underneath, because this is what was called um, a garden apartment, which means a basement apartment in New York. One of the things that puzzled me when we moved to New York, coming as we did from Canada, is that, uh, all we saw were basement apartments, which were called garden apartments. And I had rather expected, having watched romantic comedies set in New York throughout my childhood and teenage years, I had expected to be shown six floor walk-ups. Because do you remember in all of those romantic comedies from the 60s, in Barefoot in the Park, and Sunday in New York, and Barefoot on Sunday, and New York in the Park, and they all had transitive titles. They were one story told again and again. The young couple who were moving to New York right after the honeymoon had a six floor walk up and the, all the comedy was generated by the telephone installer trying to get up there, the mother-in-law dying of a heart attack on the thing. We didn't see any of those apartments, they just showed us basements. It took me a little while to realize that the reason that that was the case is because the people who had moved into the six floor walk ups in 1961 had never left them in all of that time. They were still living there because apartment hunting in New York is a kind of like a game of musical chair with no music and no chairs. <laughs> Wherever you are, you remain permanently. Now, that sounds like a, a hyperbole, right? It sounds like an exaggeration. But years later, not long ago, I was reading the autobiography of Neil Simon, the great playwright who wrote Barefoot in the Park. And it turned out that that apartment where the couple live in Barefoot in the Park, the sixth floor walk up, um, was exactly modeled on the first apartment that uh, Neil Simon and his wife Joan moved into. And they were still living in that apartment with a child when Barefoot in the Park opened on Broadway. So you have to become the single most successful commercial playwright of your time to ever leave your first apartment in New York. It's the moral of that. Well, here we were, and every night we discovered that there was a flood of cockroaches coming into this apartment. They were immensely and rather interestingly variegated. There were Asian cockroaches, as they were called. They'd arrived in squadrons. There were German cockroaches that came in uh, uh, with a, a fierce glare. There were American cockroaches, what is sometimes called water bugs, which are about the size of a fullback for the New York Giants, if you've ever seen them. And they are so enormous that they never die the first time you hit them with a sneaker. The first whop just stuns them briefly. And then you have to follow up immediately with a second one. And then they explode in a kind of liquid ball of brown liquid. And they leave behind on the floor their biceps and their thighs which are immense and articulated for you to clean up. Martha found this disturbing. She's Canadian, she's a true Canadian, Icelandic girl. And as you probably know, Canadians are the most polite people on the face of the planet. Courtesy is our national uh, preoccupation. So Martha's notion was that if we just explained or signaled to the cockroaches that they were not welcome, they would go away. Because, you know, my favorite Canadian joke is, you know how to get 25 Canadians out of a pool? You say, please get out of the pool. Well, on that same basis, Martha said, let's just get a piece of plywood and we'll put it right here. And the cockroaches, in a Canadian way, will say, oh, people are living here now. Oh, we're not wanted anymore. And they would turn away. They were New Yorkers. Of course, they did nothing of the kind. So we lived here with the cockroaches and the, some hints then of squalor, and so we decided the only way to armor ourselves against these waves of difficulty that would confront us in this first winter we would spend in New York City uh, was 
and this seems perfectly logical to me, if it doesn't to you, the only way to solve the cockroach problem was for me to buy a really nice suit. The, the logic of that was that, after all, the way to approach life is through its poetry. We love the idea of the poetry of life, by which we meant anything except rhymed and metered verse. We meant an approach, a flamboyant, a gay, a kind of devil-may-care approach to life. We wanted to be like Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald jumping into the fountain outside the plaza. And it seemed to us that if I had a really elegant suit to wear when we went down to get married at City Hall, as we were planning, Martha already had one lovely white wool dress, then we would sort of surmount, transcend, leap above the cockroaches in our basement apartment and everything else that confronted us. So we went down, we waited for a sale. I had gotten one a scholarship of $3,500 a year, renewable three times to get us through uh, our approach to New York. In Canada, $3,500 a year was regarded as this princely sum by which you could live indefinitely, New York. And we did a terrible thing. We took a chunk of that money. We went down and on sale, we bought a suit for me at Barney's, a Ted Lapidus blue suit. Someone else did the same thing in that, in, in that time. Yes, exactly. Bought the, this beautiful blue suit. I described it as navy blue. Martha called it inky blue. She had far more words for colors than I did. It was really nice with a kind of uh, nice uh, pleat in front and a uh, yoke collar in back. It was perfect. And in addition, now Ted Lapidus is not a name really to conjure with in the history of fashion, but he had done one great thing that we knew about. He had designed the white suit that John Lennon is wearing on the cover of the Abbey Road album as they walk across Abbey Road. And Martha and I, perhaps like some of you here tonight, were of a generation for whom the Beatles were not so much a musical group as a celestial event, like an eclipse or a comet, something that simply governed and oversaw your existence. So to have a suit with the mark of the Beatles upon it was truly a kind of blessing. And when I say a celestial event, I mean truly because that first fall in 1980, we looked up one October morning and there was sky writing in the sky, Yoko Ono wishing John and Sean a happy birthday. It was smiling down benevolently upon the creases in my suit. Now, as you can all see, I'm a small man. I'm a short man. Let's not, let's not pretend. And so whenever I buy a suit, and I had never bought a suit before, it has to be taken and altered. And in those days in New York, there were tailors all along First and Second Avenue, uh, Greek tailors and, and uh, Chinese tailors, Korean tailors. We went to a Greek tailor to have the suit uh, fixed to have it altered. Went in and I tried it on and the tailor looked at it and he said, it fit nice. I was very flattered. Left it there and I was going to pick it up in a week. And meanwhile, Martha went back to Montreal to gather more belongings for us to use to furnish this space. I don't know what belongings they were, but she had to go back to Montreal. So a week later, I go back to the tailors to pick up my beautiful suit. And I try it on, and he's done an absolutely perfect job of adjusting it. And I look in the mirror, and he says again, it fit nice. It fit nice. And he took the suit, and he put it in his suit bag. He put the, uh, the jacket over a hanger, and he slipped the pants on the hanger, and he zipped up the suit bag, and he handed it to me. And I took that suit bag, and I put it over my shoulder in a state of extase like Gene Kelly in Singing in the Rain, <laughs> 